As the RAC coordinator, my goal was to basically find artists, uh, teaching artists, and finding a school to place that teaching artist. So I think there's a, a, there's a balance between people that are very talented artists and then really good teachers. There's not very many that are both, and I feel like we have a great collection of people that are both. Most high schools do have an art teacher or an art program or something like that. So my tie was how am I able to get these guys in here? What specializations do they have that the regular classroom teacher is lacking? And I was able to kind of place those teachers in those schools. And I think as a result of that, the programs have been able to flourish. The essence of the project was really about helping students to understand the historical, socio-cultural foundations of music that they hear today. For a lot of students, I don't think they understand that when they turn on the radio and they hear pop music, that it comes from the black music tradition. It was important that they understood that the reason we have such a rich tradition of black music in this hemisphere is because of the slave trade. So when I talk about it, all, not just being about making music, but understanding where the music comes from, that's, that's a challenging thing to talk about, but it's important for people who look like me to help other students who look like me understand, um, understand the history behind that. Music, I think, is a great teaching tool for understanding culture because everybody listens to music, whether they are doing it intentionally or not. Most people have very strong views on music. Music is a very personal thing. We all have genres of music that we like. We all have genres of music that we don't like. One of my favorite things to do with, and I did this with the, the students um, in the history class, is to, to start playing random recordings and, and, and asking them if they liked it or not. That seems like a simple thing, but whenever, whenever you play a Tim McGraw song, and one student's like, I don't like this. And also, I don't like country music. I think music is a, a great way to help students see that from an aesthetic standpoint, you don't have to enjoy something to respect it. So I'm really big on giving students a space to say, I don't like this. Cool, tell me why. Articulate why you don't like this. Not to justify your taste, but just to be able to, to say it in a way that's respectful because music reflects our differences and we can have differences and we don't have to hate each other. So it's really almost like a microcosm for what we've always struggled with in this country, which is um, people being othered, right? So it can be kind of self-revealing and humbling. We live in a visual culture, especially this generation is inundated with images 24-7. But what is it that they're seeing? And I always ask the students this question when we begin. And typically, typically this generation is seeing selfies, a lot of self-documentation. Of course, we're all seeing advertising, but there's this other language in photography that they don't know about. And I thought, gosh, this is the perfect activity to do with a group of young people where we can make photographs and explore what it's like to live in the town where they live, look at their community, look at their lives, express their own feelings and thoughts about those things, and then put together a collection of their images that all together are their own reflection of what their lives are like. Then they're getting to see this like very advanced, cultivated way of exploring the world, seeing the world. You know, photography is a form of expression, and what I want most from the students is an honest expression, because that's how you reach people. You don't reach people through generic, you don't reach people through making something that you think people will like. You reach people by digging really deep, as hard as that is, and sharing something personal because that's often what connects to our common humanity.
So the residency that I did at Payton City High School was going to be a stage play that we were hoping to travel. And it's based on an actual court case from 1851. So we were able to bring that story to the students and then the students took just that really brief story and they developed the characters and the ideas that were gonna happen in that story. And from those characters and ideas, we created the script. Like that was a big part of what we were doing was script writing. Uh, another one was the acting skills, the performance skills, improvisation, dance, communication. Especially when you talk about theater and you're talking about doing a play, theater is nothing but communication. One part is to learn to listen to each other and have that respect and have that empathy, but also to have that confidence and that strength to voice their opinion, which is something that I think all of these residencies have an aspect to is the sense of therapy. Like we always talk about the therapeutic uh, powers that art has. And for a lot of these students, because they do come from these rural areas, they don't have a lot of exposure to things and they haven't heard a lot of things and they may not have seen a lot of the things that we're talking about. So these opportunities to do these residencies gives those students an opportunity to have that kind of growth. My project was at um, St. Joseph the Worker School in Weirton, West Virginia, and we chose to create an illustrated bird guide for um, native birds around West Virginia. I chose birds for this project because I knew that we wanted an illustrated guide, and at first it was kind of this really broad, like plants and animals and everything in between in West Virginia. I wanted to narrow down that concept and pick a species that's diverse. So I knew that was a subject that these kids could really gain an understanding and relate to. I think our connection with nature is important because it's all around us. When you walk outside, you know, you see color, you see texture, you see shape and form and line, and those are all elements of art. So maybe we don't necessarily have to know every plant species or every bird or, you know, every little natural landmark near us, but I think it's nice to really be aware and relevant to what's in front of us. At its core, the program is a collaboration between this band of urban farmers, some ACE educators, broadcasters in the region, and kids, you know, public school kids in Ohio County, who were deemed incapable of learning in a traditional environment. That was not a space where they had all of their needs met in such a way that they were able to learn. So we have built a yurt. It's a round Mongolian inspired tent. The cool thing about a yurt is that it keeps people sheltered while also being connected to the nature around you. It's a break from normalcy. You know, it's a break from kids' realities, and it gives us a chance to reset and establish a space that's new, that's fresh, where all of the basic needs can be met so that learning can then take place. One of the first things that I do with kids, I have a couple of questions, I give them 30 seconds to answer, and these questions get at the core of like, what excites them? It's that simple. And who the experts in our community are that are able to come in and demonstrate, yeah, that this is a valid passion and interest. It's very exciting to see a kid have an opportunity to talk to an expert about something that they're passionate about with an expert who's also really passionate about it. The magic there is wonderful. The kids would interview them. They would have an opportunity to learn about recording. Everybody would have different roles. We would edit together. And then the kids ultimately would record that script for broadcast. We tapped into West Virginia Public Broadcasting, and so that was a platform for these stories. It's one thing to express yourself, it's another thing to be heard. And then that, I think, is where the magic healing sort of tendency seems to happen. So when we're, when we're heard, there's something validating about that. We did the two projects together with a different grades, and then we did uh, origami, holding paper chandeliers. Uh, we used three different kind color of the origami paper and then put it together to make a three-dimensional cube. And then we put the strings on and hung it around and made a chandeliers. 
That was the first project. And then we did the second project was the Japanese traditional painting called Nihonga. They are historical painting over about a thousand years in Japan. And I imported all of the pigments from Japan. The kids are learned to hand mix colors. We mix those glue and water together and individually on a porcelain tray, each color by each color by hand and the color cannot mix so we layers and layers and layers. First of all they learn about a Japanese cultural art. I introduced them to our Japanese food culture, clothing and language. They even learn how to write their name in Japanese and they do calligraphy with me. So they were exposed to a lot of Japanese cultural art. These traditional painting techniques um, a lot of Japanese people does not even know so for them to know that it's pretty wonderful. In my residency they have to research so that the, in the end of the day they are learning about uh, West Virginia's flower, West Virginia's animal, uh, buildings, architecture and the bridges and stuff like that. So they research about their own culture. They're basically attacking both sides, the different, uh, unique, unfamiliar cultural art method to their local familiar subject matter. So going into this residency at Wheeling Park High School and knowing that I was going into the broadcast journalism class, one of the things that we really wanted to do was make it an art class. And these students, it was great because these students already knew how to use a camera and they knew how to edit. So that we didn't, and they had the resources too. They had the computers and they had the cameras and they had the mics. So the first part of the class was really me getting them to let go of their preconceived ideas of what they thought the moving image was and how it could be used and tried to get them to take the same tools that they were using to create their broadcast journalism and allow them to use it in more of an artistic manner. The way I always look at it is the, the frame, the picture frame can either be a window or it can be a canvas. You know, so if you're just setting up the camera and you're just turning it on and shooting, you're looking out the window. So again, it's not just the image that you capture, but maybe the image that you captured is the beginning of the image that you're gonna create. So you can affect that with color, you can affect that with texture, you can put movement onto that. So it was really that, it was getting them to realize that they can do so much more with this camera than just set it up on the tripod and turn it on. So when it came to the second semester and we had the students break up in the groups to do their own personal projects, it was kind of amazing, the stories that started to come forward. So there was one girl in particular had been in an abusive relationship with a boyfriend and she had kept it all in the journal and so she turned this journal into this very lyrical beautiful video piece about being in an abusive relationship in high school i mean there was no wall there like she was just exposing herself and what she had been through and it's very important i think the whole artistic process the reason that you become an artist is that it is about self-exploration like you're seeing what happens or how you think or how you respond if you add these different elements. So it's a way for the students to find themselves, not just be what they've been accustomed to or what someone has told them that they are, or what they should be. This gives them a chance to see that there are other things out there. So it really uh, allows them to find their voice and have an outlet to express it. Some of the projects that we did at Bridgeport uh, was self-portraiture. So the students got to explore different ways of making photographs of themselves. And then we took that a step further by letting them do collaging and words and you know layering things on top of their photographs. So just kind of layers of personal expression. I just really want to give teenagers that outlet because of this time in their life. There's so many very complex, complicated issues, um, but when you learn about one person, their story, what they're going through, we can all together 
start to untangle and understand issues together. The process of making a portrait of someone can be very intimate. It can really, you have to kind of slow down, look at one another, talk to one another. And one thing that we were able to bring into the conversation was the language of consent. Can I get this close? Are you comfortable? Can I move your hair? Can I, you know, all these different things, um, asking questions, negotiating with each other, um, because there's a power relationship when you have a camera, typically, between the person making the picture and the person being photographed. And so how do we make that process a more just one where we're not hurting one another, but collaborating and working with one another? So of course, like unfamiliar material, they're confused first, hesitated, and at the same time, they're very excited. I was excited and a little scared. Where's the line? How uncomfortable can I make them? How open to this will they be? Are they ready for it? I... Sometimes there's a lot of nerves. I love those times. It's like, basically we're creating an environment where it's okay to be vulnerable with each other. And that can be an uncomfortable space, but it's always enriching. It really forced the students to work in a way that they were unaccustomed to. With all these residencies that I do in the different schools, it always becomes challenging. And there always are times where you're sort of not succeeding and you have to allow the students to know that that's part of the process, but you have to keep going forward. I always tell each student that this is not your personal art project. This is a collaboration art. So you are going to be a part of somewhere in this process. Even you just hold the first triangle of the origami paper, that's all you did it but you're participating to the process of making a bigger scale artwork together. I think art is really impactful to middle schoolers and I think it does help really bring their confidence up because you know, with my project, we did have some curriculum that was specific. You know, We had to understand anatomy of birds and we had to be able to create a color palette. So there are things that are specific, but at the same time, these students had a lot of freedom in their artwork to express how they wanted their artwork to be seen. So there was a lot of self-expression. They had a lot of choices that they were able to make in that process. We had just gotten to the point where we were gonna to start to engage the community in, in terms of, of rehearsals after school and preparing for a concert when, when COVID hit. So because of the pandemic, everything got shut down in March. So we had to walk away from the project. You know, they, they had been making pictures of themselves and their friends, but we wanted to extend it into the larger school community. And so they had begun to collaborate with the teachers and the school and other classes about setting up these portrait projects and times. And the school, like all schools, shut down. And um, eventually was able to shift to remote learning. I was lucky that I was able to continue with that process and encouraging them to use photography as a way to cope and express themselves and document this time in our history. But the collaborating art teacher, she really wanted to somehow finish the project. And even though we couldn't use our idea, the concept we'd had of making this a mural that included the school community, the students had made portraits of each other throughout the early months. And so, you know, we just had to think creatively about what we could present. And so we had a photograph of each student in the class. They had made these pictures of each other and that ended up being our public mural. While we didn't really get to engage the community, I, I, I think we had some breakthroughs in students that might not normally come to music or the arts, it was neat to see them sort of evolve and recognize the importance of what we were talking about. I think when it comes to any you know, form of art or any type of art that you do, um, you know, the process is always more important than the outcome. It's that concept of while you're creating, what are you feeling? It's about that journey, okay? If you knew exactly where you were going, then it wouldn't be worth going there. It's about getting lost 
and the things that you discover in that creative process are things that you're discovering about yourself because nothing's going to go exactly how you want it to and that's great because now you have all these challenges and you have to figure out how am I going to resolve this challenge? What am I going to do? Because like they say, the show must go on, like something has to happen. So that's where that sort of abstract thought and creative problem solving comes in, is that we have a problem, how do we solve it? A lot of times what we would do that was exciting, we could spring off of that and get the students improvising. And I believe that people who are adept at musical improvisation are creative problem solvers. You need to be preparing students, regardless of their major, to be lifelong learners, to be creative problem solvers, and to be critical thinkers, and to be good citizens, right? And you might think that's a little bit pie in the sky to tie back to improvisation, but um, to be a good improviser, you have to be able to listen to other people. So we just tried to keep it simple in that experience and just get them doing that. Um, that's not going to result in any kind of big concert at the end of the deal. But what it's going to result in is people leaving that class, understanding that there's more to music than just turning on their phone, and that um, with a little bit of information, they can start to engage with music in a meaningful way and, and be creators. What we need to do to prepare them for that is focus very intentionally on cultivating what are today referred to as soft skills, okay? So that means creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, working with a team. You have to be able to cultivate a human being who is adaptable and creative in order to prepare that person for what's coming next. So all of those things are the focus by design of this program. The students had written small reflections. You know, we took time to ask questions about their hopes, their fears, what they think about, and then we combined those things with their images. What they said was most important to them were the connections that they had made with their classmates. And um, they said that it was really unusual uh, because they all were kind of from different cliques and different peer groups. And honestly, I don't think that you can make work with depth and vulnerability unless you have a safe space in which to create it. And um, if you've ever seen Sister Carita's 10 Rules for Making Art, rule number one is find a safe space and try trusting that space for a while. The RAC residencies have allowed Ogilvy Institute not only to just work with new artists, but also allows us to work with new schools and have that relationship, know that Ogilvy Institute and the Stifle Fine Arts Center is this resource that these teachers can use. So it allowed us to get the foot in the door in all of these new schools that we never had our, our foot in the door before. So um, it's allowed me to have these relationships with these classroom teachers that once again benefit us in the long run because now they come along and they do other programs that we offer here. They realize that there's other resources that the Stifle Center can, can provide their students and so that allows us to build this relationship, not just for that one year residency, but now hopefully for the length of this classroom teacher's career. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. It just exploded the photography department, leaps and bounds, and the opportunities that we had is just amazing. It didn't just compliment, it exceeded like all expectations and goals that we had set for the school. It also opened up an avenue that I wasn't too familiar with, with photojournalism and storytelling through photography, whether it wasn't just an art form, but an actual storytelling process. The arts as a whole is something that's so important for their mental health, and mental health is a huge issue and focus on our projects that we've got going on this year, especially with the pandemic. So art has definitely been an outlet, a release, a creative side for them to explore, and it's just been a godsend for the kids. So I sent it to the person who inspired the zine, and he did this incredible write-up about it. It absolutely shocked me. And yeah, so what that did is 
that um, skyrocketed what the students had made to a worldwide audience. It led to people all over the world collecting it. And yes, of course, that recognition is really nice, but in the end, what was amazing is that we were able to give each of those students $250. It was one way that they could really get value from their art, um, especially before they were headed off to college or whatever the next steps were for them. Something that seems so unattainable for the small town of Belair to reach such notoriety and publicity and you know, praise, like anything is possible, the sky's the limit. I mean, I have students telling me that when they grow up, they might be a photographer now just because of that, that process. So it has really just like made my heart so happy. I never needed to be told that the folks who are teaching in K through 12 have a whole bunch of chops that I don't have. I knew that, but to see it, it gave me a, an even deeper appreciation for the work that folks are doing when they're teaching high school students. Sometimes they get a bad knock from folks in college. Uh, we're not seeing these students come to us with, with the same level of preparation that we had. And it, they're coming with different preparation because the world is different. All of the teachers that I worked with, they are, became my friends and they were inspiring. They're my partner in crime. So usually I'm only working with one teacher, but in this case I was able to work with four teachers. And that was a lot of fun, just interacting with the teachers and getting them to get excited about the project. And it sort of became something that the whole school could own. Really, my students, they got to be celebrities in the area. There were, th you know, uh, 32 by 56 inch printouts of their faces on the side of the building. It was super exciting for them. It's still exciting, a year later. It was, it's still exciting for everybody. <laughs> It's drawn a lot of attention to our school. They can see that the kids are individuals. Those pictures that were on the side of the building, I think displayed their personalities almost perfectly. And we wanted to show the community that we had a lot of really great individuals at our school and they deserved recognition. And I think the community could see that. It was larger than life, you can't miss it. So in order to do a public mural, there's a whole process of talking to the principal and reaching out to the city council and um, the students were all involved in crafting messages and PowerPoints and learning to explain what they were doing. So that, that was a way they kind of collaborated and connected with the community. You know, it was so nice to put this in a very public place and have the students' faces um, because Boy, that was one segment of our population that was hit hard because of the pandemic. So I hope they were recognized and remembered through this. They were able to learn about the inner workings of a camera. Like I said, they'd never touched one before, so they, they learned how the light came in. They learned about the aperture, the f-stops. They learned about composition and how to set up a photo. It was just fun to watch them put all this together. Plus, she helped encourage their independence they're still developing. They're trying to figure out who they are. And if somebody believes in them, that just makes them, uh, that's gonna make them a much stronger adult. In our world, this is part of our society that we're, we're raising and we're telling them it's okay to be who they are. It was their vision. She, we, we facilitated anything that they needed. We would help them, we would back them up. Um, but it was their ideas. It, that was probably the best part of it all. And I think it was important to them that they were able to express themselves in that way. It was really cool. I am so grateful <laughs> for this opportunity to work and engage with the community partners, with the kids, to learn and to grow together with the community. The fact that this is a possibility here and that this has been afforded to me, this possibility to work and collaborate in this way has been an incredible personal opportunity for me, like for personal growth and, and whatnot and, and just life experience. Um, I cherish the time that I've had and I will always cherish that time. So I am above anything else, I am grateful for that. The classroom teacher's response has always been very positive. There are obviously scheduling hurdles that we all have to climb 
but I think they also realize the benefits that are gonna come from this and they are always about their kids. They want their kids to have this exposure. And so having their students have this opportunity to have a professional artist come in and work with them for a whole year, they tend to drop the schedule and say, hey, we're doing this, let's do this. I don't know how many more opportunities we have, but we're gonna seize this opportunity. So you have somebody that just didn't learn about it in school. They are actually out there doing it as a profession, as their job. That brings a whole different skill set, I think, into a classroom setting. And I think that real world experience translates to these students in a different way. They can see the potential of what they can do as a profession. And being creative in a workforce is huge. And whether they are a great artist, that's fine. As long as they can think of in creative thoughts, I think those creative problem solving skills that these residencies can provide for them, I think will change their lives.